Gotcha. <laughs> we now have one final address for this session. It's an English speech attaining peace of mind and Islamic perspective. Molana Umair Khan Sahib, I invite you to the stage, please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lahu. Wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. Amma ba'adhu fa'uzu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Mir Saab, I, I feel like I have the most difficult task in front of me today is to give the last speech of the day to an audience that I know is exhausted. I know it. Inshallah, bear with me and I hope we get through the next few minutes and I will try my best, Inshallah, to keep you all engaged and we'll get through these next 20 minutes or so and uh, it'll eventually come to an end. I will try my best. My dear brothers and sisters, I have been asked to speak on the topic of attaining peace of mind and Islamic perspective. When I was thinking about talk, talking on this topic, a recent incident came to my mind. A few months back, a family member of mine, she got a new job. And she was telling me how that job was going and she mentioned to me that during the lunch break, her and some of her co you know, new uh, co-workers, they were all together socializing and talking. And within that group, there was a young man who had some anxiety problems. And he was very open about it and he used to share that these are the medications that I was taking. There were five people in that group. Now the interesting thing was that within that you know, group of five people, two more people spoke up and said, these are the medications I am taking for depression. In other words, more than half of that group was openly talking about the antidepressants that they were taking. And this shocked me. And this is something that many of us have never heard of before, that these are the types of conversations people were having at the workplace. What kind of antidepressants are you on? Two days ago, we had the JALSA inspection uh, program here. And I remember I was in the Lunger. And I sat down and a khadim was sitting in front of me, never met him before. He started talking to me and he started telling me about his experience growing up here in Toronto and some of the difficulties he's gone through, 24 years old. And within that conversation, he says something very interesting. He says that two of my friends have committed suicide. My dear brothers and sisters, I am narrating personal experiences with you. I haven't even gotten to the statistics yet. The World Health Organization says currently there are 280 million people who are depressed. The World Health Organization says there are 700,000 suicides that happen every year. And to give it a local touch, the Canadian Mental Health Association, they say from 2008 to 2019, there has been a 61% increase in hospitalizations due to mental disorders. Now, what is the solution to this problem? Well, honestly, it depends on who you ask. If you ask your family doctor, they may say that it's a poor stress management skills. It may be due to family history or medical uh, conditions that is leading to a brain chemical imbalance and your serotonin levels and dopamine levels are not balanced out and that's why you're sad and depressed. And if you go to your natural path, he'll say maybe it's a vitamin D deficiency, you have to increase your magnesium. You go to the homeopath, he'll give you some of that Nux Vomica 30. So what is the solution to this problem when there are millions of people suffering from this? 
My job today is to share with you what the Islamic perspective is. And what I was thinking was, let's first explore what is the cause of this issue and problem first. Let's figure that out and see what Islam teaches about that. Now when we look into this topic, some of the things that constantly come up as to why people are lacking that peace of mind and tranquility and peace and happiness, one of the things that will come up is traumatic and distressful events. Another thing that will come up is losing a loved one, substance abuse, marital problems, isolation and loneliness, or it could be a medical or health problem. So what I will try my best to do in the next few minutes is touch on some of these where people are complaining about falling into depression and explore what the Quran, what Islam teaches regarding these issues about traumatic and distressful events. Now this can differ from people to person to person. It may be because a loss of a job, financial difficulties, losing a loved one, or a constant state of fear may be related to some job instability. Now what does the Holy Quran teach? The Holy Quran teaches something very beautiful where Allah Ta'ala has been very straightforward with the believers and has let believers know that, look, this world is not a walk in the park. There will be times where you will be shaken up and you will come into a state of fear and anxiety. Allah Ta'ala says, وَلَا نَبْلُوا وَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوْئِ وَالنَّقْسِ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنْفُسِ وَالْسَّمَرَاتِ Allah says, and we will try you with something of fear and hunger and loss of wealth and lives. Allah has made it very clear that, look, these are the realities of life. You will go through them. But towards the end of this verse, Allah says, Wa bashari sabirin, Give glad tidings, give good news to those who are patient. And Allah has made this very clear in different parts of the Quran. He re-emphasizes this message for those people who are struggling and going through difficulties. In another place, Allah re-emphasizes this message by saying, "Fa inna ma al usri yusra, inna ma al usri yusra." There is ease after hardships. Hang on in there; these things will pass, and things will get better. The promised Messiah, Allah Salatu Wasalam, has said, "The fact is that the pleasure of God Almighty, which is the cause of true happiness, cannot be attained until one bears temporary hardships." Blessed are those who do not care for suffering sustained in order to acquire the pleasure of Allah. For the light of eternal bliss and everlasting comfort is granted to a believer after this temporary hardship. My dear brothers and sisters, sisters Allah recognizes that these times of difficulties and distress is not something easy for us as humans and individuals to go through. And for this, Allah also gives a solution to the problem in the Holy Quran. Allah says, Ya yuhallazina amanusta'inu bis sabri was salah. That, O ye who believe, seek Allah's help. Turn to Allah with patience and prayer. This is the ingredient the Quran gives to get through those difficult times because they are temporary. And Allah tells those people that, Look, I am with you. Inna Allah ma'asabirin that surely Allah is with those who are patient. This is what the Qur'an teaches, is to bear that difficulty and turn towards Allah with your prostrations and prayers. And you will see that Allah will change your difficulties into ease. The promised Messiah, alayhi salatu wasalam, has said, a believer has a brave heart because his trust is in God Almighty. If he goes through difficulties, he does not lose heart. On the contrary, he marches forward despite the difficulties. It is in trouble, illness, and other difficulties that one is tested out. These trials show as to who has a firm relationship with Allah and believes in his powers. Look at the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Wasallam. Death surrounded him. He was born with the experience of the death of his father, with the experience of the death of his mother at six, 
Two years later, his grandfather at the age of eight died. He's buried so many people in his life, yet still five times a day, he would stand in front of Allah and say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, all praise belongs to Allah, Lord of all the worlds, ar rahman ar rahim the gracious, the merciful. And about such people, the Quran, the Quran gives the glad tidings that Allah sends his angels to take care of their worries and griefs. Inna lazina kalu rabbunallahu sumastakamu tatanazzalu alayhimul malaikatu alla takhafu wa la tahzanu. As for those who say our Lord is Allah and then remain steadfast, the angels descend on them, on, on them saying, fear ye not nor grieve. My dear brothers and sisters, another common issue that is causing a lot of depression and anxiety in people are marital problems. What solution does Islam give to this? And when I was thinking about this topic, I realized that Islam gives a very unique solution that the rest of the world has not offered. You won't see the rest of the world talk about this. The Prophet Muhammad wasallam guided Muslims and said, Islam guided Muslims that precautions for marital problems have to be taken well before the time of marriage. And we know this advice. All of us have heard this before. The Prophet Muhammad wasallam said, there are four categories that people look at when they are looking for a spouse. They look at wealth. They want to see, can this person financially take care of me? And this is common in women when they are looking for a husband. They look at family prestige. Some people get very impressed that, oh, this is a family that have million dollar contract businesses, or this is a family that has, you know, companions or righteous people in their uh, family bloodlines. Another thing the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that people look at is physical beauty and also righteousness. Now the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't say that do not look at these things. But he said, give righteousness and piety the highest priority. My dear brothers and sisters, in most, country, in most countries, the divorce rate is well above 50%. And one of the reasons for these problems is because these things are overlooked. When your marriage and your relationship is based on beauty, how do you expect such a marriage to last? Today we look good. Many of us, like me, I know when the hairline starts receding, you don't look as good as you did five, ten years ago. You start getting white patches, it's not the same anymore. If that's the reason you married someone, how do you expect that marriage to last? That's no foundation. If you married someone because they have money, they have business, they're successful. The last two years, have you seen how many businesses have gone bankrupt? How many people have lost their jobs? These things are temporary. That's why the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam guided and said, look at piety and righteousness because piety is a mark of beauty that lasts throughout difficult and trying times. Rather, with time, it becomes even more attractive and beautiful. And this is the same category that Allah judges people according to. Inna akramakum inda lahi attaqum that the most honorable among you is he who is most righteous. And people that follow these guidelines of Islam and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi enjoy a marriage which is described in the Quran in the following words. Allah says, and one of his signs is this, that he has created wives for you from among yourselves. لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً that you may find peace of mind in them. And he has put love and tenderness between you. This is what a marriage should look like. Now we all know that even within these types of marriages that are done in the lines of taqwa, the up and downs can happen, some fighting, arguments, bickering can happen. And the Quran also gives a very beautiful and unique solution to this problem. I call this a short, to the point, a couple's therapy according to the Qur'an. Listen to it carefully, it's very short. Allah says about righteous people that one of their signs is وَالْقَازِمِينَ الْغَيْزِ that they suppress 
their anger. Wal afina anin nas and pardon and forgive people. My dear brothers and sisters, suppressing and controlling your anger is one of the best preventive measures one can take in saving their marriages and living happy and peacefully within their homes. There's a beautiful hadith I'm eager to share with you related to this. The Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu once sitting with his companions, he said, one is not strong because of one's wrestling skillfully. And this surprised the companions. And keep in mind, 1400 years ago, that was a tribal warfare society where the strongest people were leaders of tribes. So the companions were surprised that if that person who is a fighter, who is a warrior, is not the strongest person, the O Messenger of Allah, who is the strongest person? Look at this beautiful answer he gives. He says, Allazi yamliku nafsahu al ghazab. The true warrior is he who controls himself when he is angry. Islam does not say that, you know, the Muhammad Ali's, the Mike Tyson's, Conor McGregor's and the Khabib's, that those are the true fighters. Islam teaches that it's those husbands and fathers who are living in their homes and get angry and have disagreements and their bodies want to react and lash out at their wife or their children, but they suppress themselves only for the sake of Allah to keep the peace, happiness, and tranquility. Islam says those mothers and those wives who are in their homes get distressed because of their duties and want to lash out and control their anger. These, according to Islam, are the true warriors. There was an incident of the promised Messiah Islam, where he was writing an essay and his son, who later became Hazrat Khalifa Masih Sani Anhu, came into the room. He was four years old at that time. And he came into the room with a lantern and a few uh, you know, other children came into the room. The promised Messiah Islam, was so busy in writing you know, books in defense of Islam, he didn't notice anything. And those uh, uh, Mia Mahmoud, four years old, he took some papers and started burning them. The Promised Messiah Islam, still did not notice anything, which shows and highlights the focus he had in defending Islam. Eventually a time came where he had to refer to some of those old papers. And he asked, what happened to those papers? And a child finally spoke up and said, Mia Mahmoud has burned them. The whole house fell quiet. Someone putting their hard work and energy in writing and authoring books. And someone, his own child, burns the papers. But my dear brothers, listen to this answer very carefully. Magar Hazrat Muskarakar farmate hain khub hua. Isme Allah Taala ki koi badi maslehat hogi. Aur ab Khuda Taala chahta hai ki isse behtar mazmoon hume samjaye. The Promised Messiah Wasallam said, what has happened is good. There must be some wisdom in this from God and that God desires that he should teach us a better understanding of the subject. My dear brothers and sisters, it's reasons like this that millions of people around the world have given their allegiance to this man. These are not normal words. These are true people of God. My dear brothers and sisters, I had some more things to touch on, but I know uh, time is limited, so I will try to come towards the end of this speech. When we see the world around us, we see a desperate pursuit towards attaining material success. The desires to attain material wealth has blinded man from the true purpose of his life, which was to recognize and establish a living relationship with Allah, who is the true source of peace. And we see Allah has warned us in the Holy Quran, al haqam takasur mutual rivalry in pursuit of material success and wealth diverts people away from Allah. Hatta zurtumul makabir, until you reach the grave. Islam has made it clear that that material pursuit of success is a never ending cycle. Today you get a house, tomorrow you want two. Today you get a car, tomorrow you want luxury. 
You will never be satisfied and Allah gives the ultimate solution to this problem. He says, those who believe in whose hearts find comfort in the remembrance of Allah. Allah bi zikrillahi tatma'innul kulub. A, it is in the remembrance of Allah that hearts can find peace. My dear brothers and sisters, look at the world around us. We see people who have reached the heights of material success. We look at celebrities, world elite athletes, business moguls. Yet every once in a while when we put on the news, we see headlines that they have taken their own lives. Or that they have run-ins with substance abuse to try to find anything to try to attain some kind of peace because of the depression, the grief, the sadness that they are going through. This is where Allah says, Allah bi zikrillahi tatma innul kulub that it is in the remembrance of Allah that hearts can find peace. My dear brothers, another thing I want to make very clear to you today is that this verse, many of us see it. We see the calligraphy in our mosques. We have heard this over and over, that in the remembrance of Allah, it is where hearts can find peace. But let me make it clear to my brothers and sisters that if you think that by sitting at the mosque all day and saying, Allah, 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 that all your grief, your sadness, your depression will vanish. I hate to break it to you, but that is not what this verse means. What it means is that along with your worship and remembrance of Allah, you back it up with action. And that is why the next word, verse following it says, Allazina amanu, that O ye who believe, wa amilu salihate and who do good actions. Tuba lahom, happiness shall be theirs. Look at the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Every step he took, he remembered Allah. From the time he woke, to every morsel that he put in his mouth, going in and out of his home, going into the mosque, every direction, every angle you look at the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu he remembered Allah. But then when someone asked his wife, Hazrat Aisha Razi Anha, explain the character and the you know, personality of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what did she reply? She said, Kana khulukuhul Quran, that he was a living example of the Holy Quran. So my dear brothers and sisters, if we have a desire to attain a peace of mind, you must remember to do that. The prerequisite is that you must become an agd or a servant of Allah, the way the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was. And just to highlight this beautiful relationship, this love story between the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and his creator, it is painted in the following words in the Holy Quran. Ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutma'inna and thou, O soul, at peace Return to thy Lord well pleased with him and he well pleased with thee. So enter thou among my chosen servants and enter thou my garden. I will end my speech with a quotation of the promised Messiah والسلام, on the subject. He says, Whosoever prays at a time of hardship and stress and desires a solution, then of course, if he prays sincerely, he will attain peace and true contentment from God. And if he does not receive that solution, then he will still be granted some other type of ease and tranquility from God. The real meaning of prayer is to attain peace of mind and true contentment. And it is not right that our true happiness can only be attained by what we pray for, Rather, God, who knows where our true happiness lies, grants us what he wills from that complete prayer. That happiness that cannot be attained purely by wealth, kingdom, or health is only in the hands of God who grants it to whomsoever he wills. And it is granted to those who are complete in their level of prayer. If God desires, he could grant a sincere and truthful person who prayed during hardship the delight which a king on a throne cannot even attain. So, this is true success, which is granted in result of prayer. Therefore, this peace of mind and contentment of the soul cannot be attained 
by only man's own works. Rather, only with prayer is it possible. آو لوگو کہ یہیں نور خدا پاؤ گے لو تمہیں طور تسلی کا بتایا ہم نے کم او پیپل تس ہیئر یو ول فائن دا لائٹ آف گاڈ لو وی ہیو ٹولڈ یو اے وے ٹو سیٹسفائی یور سیلف و آخر دعوان ان الحمد للہ رب العالمین جزاک اللہ السلام علیکم Zakum Allah Mawlana Umair Khan Sahib for those powerful closing thoughts for us to take on this second day and third session of our Jalsa.